Hello world, this is Hello Chaos, the podcast about the ups and downs, highlights and low points of entrepreneurship, where we bring on founders of all sorts to talk about their real stories and hopefully things that you can take away to make your next moves. I am one host, Jennifer Oligdipo, aka Jenno. And I am Jennifer Sutton, aka JJ, as my friends and family tend to call me. And today's our guest, I'm so excited to have on. Um, this is Herbert Drayton from Highmark Capital down in Charleston, South Carolina. Hi, Mark. Hi, hi, Herbert. I was almost said like, <laughs> hi, <Herbert>. hi, Mark. <laughs> um, Herbert, thank you for coming on and uh, and sharing and My sparing pleasure. some time. Yeah. Uh, yeah he's, Herbert's a busy guy. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. I was like, I am so <laughs> grateful that you... Yeah. Um, you could join us, but actually, I'm curious. Where did you get your name, Highmark Capital? Where does that come from? Oh, interesting. That's probably the second time someone's ever asked me that question. Um, really? With Highmark Capital, the, because the, the the general perception in the world or, or across the VC landscape is that there are not enough um, um, BIPOC and women entrepreneurs that produce high growth, scalable enterprises. And which has resulted in less than one percent of the VC money going to Black founders, and less than five percent going to women founders, and about 0.2 percent going to uh, uh, Black women founders. So I want to send the message that we can reach the high water mark in terms of growth and scalable companies. So that's where high mark came from. Hmm. I love it. Yeah. And now repeat. Now I'm going to have you repeat some of those stats because because we've said we've talked about those stats before on yeah. a, on a couple other um, conversations we've had with some female founders and some and some um, black owned founders and and when I share that to others outside of our world, the the jaw tends to drop. Of you're telling me one percent or less than five. I mean five percent for you know woman owned. And I don't think that stat gets shared enough. So I'm going to have you just repeat that again because <laughs> you're the expert. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So VC dollars flowing into black founders, uh, companies with black founders, it's at 1, 1%. Last year, it was 1.3%, but it's trailing. It's trending back towards the 1%. I think George Floyd, um, the, uh, the social unrest related to George Floyd's killing caused a bump in that. Um, for women founders, it's less than 5%. Um, a couple of years, I think last year that number dropped to like 4%, somewhere around there. That's right. But if you are a black female founder, that number is right around 0.2%. That needle itself has not moved. Wow. Fascinating. And so you decided to step in and yeah. and do something about this what i mean what, what what made you say okay i'm going to because you've been you know in the business world for quite some time what made you say okay i'm actually going to get in and step in as a funder now and and, and create high mark and do it that way versus well a, a couple numbers. actually yeah right around the um george floyd um george floyd's death a lot of colleagues reached out to me i said colleagues in the money space they reached mm -hmm. out and said that they wanted to do something for the black community. And because of my role with the Coastal Community Foundation, I saw a lot of philanthropic dollars flowing in. And those philanthropic, philanthropic dollars were being moved to black led, black serving nonprofit organizations. So I challenged my colleagues to invest in black owned businesses. And my comment to them was that, um, you know, philanthropy will not solve the wealth gap. We've got to invest in black owned businesses. Yeah. And, and a lot of them said yes, but when I presented them with companies to invest in, they used the traditional reasons why they didn't want to invest in them. Mm -hmm. It's not, not, not in their investment thesis, it's too early. So all the standard excuses they, they gave, and when I continued to do the research, that's when I first looked at those statistics. But then I also realized that we didn't have a, a black VC firm in the state of South Carolina. So we're not going to solve the problem unless we change the folks who are in charge of investing the money. And that's when I decided to lean into the VC space and work with my partner. Um, we, we finally sold our last two companies in early January. So it, it allowed me to focus 100% on the VC firm. Hmm. And has this, has this entrepreneurial endeavor been different um, from, from any of the mm -hmm. others? Or, or how has it been different? I'm sure it has been. 
I think the, the, the only difference, Jeno and, and JJ, is that because it's new, um, and what I mean by new is that, number one, there, there aren't that many black VC fund managers in the country, much less there wasn't one in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah I was told, yeah, there were two things. One was that um, because I was a first time fund manager, most institutions would not want to invest in my fund. And two, there would not be enough deal flow. So simultaneously, I started raising the fund as well as interviewing um, businesses. And I've talked with over 200 entrepreneurs over the past 18 months and probably the same number of folks trying to get them to invest in the fund. So uh, both have been a very heavy lift, I will say. And, um, you know, as it turns out right now, it looks like I've got about a dozen, dozen and a half companies that I would say are investment ready. And then I've got the same number of possible uh, LPs that um, limited partners who will invest in the fund. And so, so that's interesting to say that it was a heavy lift with the entrepreneurs. That's our, that's our main audience, founder focus, uh, mm-hmm. founder led companies. Mm-hmm. So I'm really curious. I mean, you know, you would think that people would just kind of jump at the opportunity. What, what was the uh, heavy lift there to sign on your companies, your build your portfolio? Well, well, yeah, the heavy lift, every, everybody thinks that their business is a, uh, is a million dollar or will be a million dollar business, right? Um, but then those, those are some tough conversations that, that I've had to have with many. And I think the, um, they fit, and, and this, is, this is the same with all entrepreneurs, I think they fit in, in a couple of buckets. One of those buckets is that they've got a business that will be owner operator, people you, you know unfairly would characterize him as mom and pop, lifestyle businesses where Person is going to do enough to make enough to live on, maybe enough to send their, their, their kids to school. Um, those aren't the types of companies that need VC money. Mm-hmm. What I like to share with folks when they ask why I can't invest, and I simply say because if I give you a dollar and you put it in your pocket, you owe me three or you owe me five. Right. That's just, the, that's just how the VC world works. But if you simply need a, 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 a bridge loan or a loan to fund a project, um, I introduce them to um, CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions. A lot okay. of them have not, not heard of those. Yeah. So I'll help them prepare one page, do the initial introduction to see if there's interest, and then I'll connect them. There are also some some companies out there, they just need a grant um, to, to, to get their enterprise to the next level. I'll help them identify grant opportunities within the state and point them in that direction. And in a lot of cases, um, the Coast Community Foundations, the folks on the community uh, grant making community leadership side, they will educate um, the entrepreneurs what they need to do to apply for a grant. And and that's been very helpful as well. And and the ones who um, who are VC ready, then that's a that's a different conversation, helping the point to point them in the right direction as well. And you're you're hearing that from not just. black owned businesses, woman owned businesses. I mean, when you're talking about those, those, those pockets of people just might not be ready for VC. Um, do you see any difference between what you're having to do to educate black owned and woman owned businesses to be ready for VC or, or what to do, um, to prepare themselves for VC versus ever, you know, the standard entrepreneur? Is there any difference? No, what, what I'm finding, um, JJ is that a lot of folks, they, they want the money, they just don't know what, what pocket or what bucket they're coming out of. Um, because again, some folks, they, they don't want to grow beyond just providing a living for their family. Mm. Um, and probably the hardest thing for me is to tell them, no, you don't need VC money. Um, you need to look at one of these other options. And, and I, will, I, I will also share that one of the, one of the biggest hindrances to funding is poor credit or, or lack of collateral. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I strongly suggest folks look for partnerships uh, to do deals in, in that scenario, because not everybody out there has a, you know, 400 credit score. Somebody in business has a 700 credit score. Somebody in business has land that they're not leveraging right now um, that they could, they could put up as collateral for business. And it's sometimes just, Find um, I, I, as I like to share with entrepreneurs, that there are very few um, scenarios that they face. I have only scenario 
since I've been an entrepreneur that I have not faced is bankruptcy. Mm. Um, I've had payroll issues. I've had to leverage mm-hmm. uh, a colleague's land to get a loan to buy equipment. So you, you name it, I think I, I've, I've run the gamut with that. And which of those, are, did any of those experiences, um, how do they apply? Because to my mind, the business of, of money, right, just seems very different. It's a, it's a different category from even, you know, from services, from manufacturing, mm-hmm. from, from SaaS, from all the different things. It's just, it's, um, you know, finance, banking, uh, all that kind of stuff always is, it's just so different. Um, even when I was a business reporter, just looking at it and reporting at it, it was just like a whole other world. And so I wonder if as an entrepreneur. And it's are, intimidating as an entrepreneur. Perhaps. Yeah. I don't know. Like, that's what I was wondering. Does it, does it feel different to be in the money business? Hmm. No, it, it's different. Um, and let me, let me just do a, a quick comment on that. I think one of the areas where most entrepreneurs, including myself, make the mistake regarding financing is we wait until we actually need it. Mm-hmm. Um, when your business is strong, that's when you should establish a relationship with financial, financial mm-hmm. institution. That's when you should establish a cash line of credit so that you're not struggling and then going to ask when, you're, when your financials have been compromised. When things are going well, that's when you get those, those, those cash lines of credit. And, I, I did learn that. Um, and in terms of right now where I am, I'm just looking forward to, I, I've got, like I said, a dozen and a half companies that I'm looking forward to writing checks for these folks <laughs> yeah. and, and seeing them go to the next level. Um, I'm also looking forward to all the companies that I, I will invest in. I'm, I'm preparing them for a series A. And part of, part of what I educate co- the, the business owners are, we need to position your business to sell it two or three times. And that starts a whole different conversation. Again, mm-hmm. I've done that before where we've sold the business, but we've gotten, we've kept a little bit of the equity and we've gotten an employment contract. And then the goal is to help, let's say that you had a 70% position in the business. When you do the sale, you sell 60% of it and you still have 10%, and now you've got an employment contract with a little bit of ownership, if you know that business well, you should help the new owners grow that business so that your 10% that you left on the table mm-hmm. is worth more than the 60% you gave away a couple of years earlier. Okay. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, I don't think most people think about it that mm-hmm. way. Um, you know, there's so much of that, um, I this is my thing, I mm-hmm. want to own it. And I've heard people say, you yep. know, do you want 100%, 100% of you know, $10,000 or, or 1% of 10 million. Yeah. Well, I had a conversation with a young man last week and trying to match him up with a company that I have that they're going to license technology for me. And my goal is to find the management team. Hmm. And when I told him that I would have a 75% position in the company, he said, well, I want ownership. And my question is, do you want ownership or control? Those are, those are those are two different, different things. Because, mm-hmm. Yes, yes. A, a different level of conversation because if you want ownership for uh, money purposes, we can work that operating agreement. At the end of the day, if you're the operator, you should reap the most rewards, right? Mm-hmm. So let's give you control. And then if you take this business and you grow it significantly over five years, we can put in a kicker that allows you to make a lot more money than your equity position implies at the time that we sign the agreement. And so you're saying that a lot of your folks, uh, a lot of the folks that you talk to aren't ready for VC money. And when people are ready, just what are some of the kinds of differences it can, it, it's, mm-hmm. it can make um, for, for companies? I mean, even like, you know, folks in, in, your, in your portfolio, just what, what kinds of difference is this funding going to make? And what, what are sort of the amounts also um, that people are so so the average investment will be 250 and i I think one of the biggest things that entrepreneurs that that partner with me need to realize is that it comes with wraparound services and and you know as an example most white on most most bipoc and women entrepreneurs we don't have that invisible ecosystem that most of the white uh, entrepreneurs have um, I don't have a lawyer in my family. I don't have a CPA in my family. I don't have a, a family member that owns, um, you know, that owns a, a marketing firm. 
So the, one of the first things that we will do is, you know, we'll bring in a CPA firm and they will do sort of a forensics review of your financials because we want to prepare you for that series A early on, but then we'll determine whether or not you need a, a fractional executive to help you. Um, and that's sometimes a heavy lift, but part of the investment will come, part of the investment dollars will be committed to that fractional CFO or to that fractional CEO, chief strategy officer. Um, that, that, that's usually the part where I, I get some degree of pause um, from, from the entrepreneurs because, again, that's giving up control, but mm -hmm. it's only, I, I call it transitional control. So we give up control for six months to a year to make sure we set the right metrics. And then as we're measuring quarter to quarter, everybody's on the same page. We know where we are. We know what we have to do as we continue to move forward. Yeah, funders usually step in a lot, but this really sounds like a lot of almost like a an incubator. That's what, I, yeah, uh, like an accelerator program. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you called it right. I am partnered with a group called Generator. Um, oh, okay. They've got 38 accelerators across the country and um, in cities across the country. And part of my partnership is how they've been doing it. They know what has to be done. Not only do they know where some of the resources are, They'll incorporate the local resources <clears throat> from the community. But more importantly, um, JJ and, Gen and, and, and Geno, it's that follow on funding. Mm -hmm. So they've got an access to a wide venture capital network. If you're going to build something to sell, you have to have somebody that wants to buy it. Yeah. And um, that's because we don't have a whole lot of the VC network in, in South Carolina is light right now. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to make sure we have. I guess a Stacey's who resonate with the investment thesis because we if we've got a history of what these VCs look for when they invest, we can build these companies to the point so that when we make the phone calls and I, right, you know, these folks are ready for the next level. Can we have a conversation? And and then we make those introductions and walk them into these folks' office. And is are most of your um companies that you're funding, I'm assuming they're all in South Carolina, so you're trying to help generate and help build uh, Black-owned businesses succeed and so, accelerate, or are you looking just outside of just any good investment? Uh, Southeast is, is, is the target, um, and, and that's, that's, that's loose. Uh, if there's at least one founder here in the state of South Carolina or the company has a nexus back to South Carolina, okay. I, I will say that um, there's... I think north of $20 million that's going to be distributed to three VC firms here in the state, mine being one good growth capital. And I think um, Venture Carolina or Venture South, I think Venture Carolina is the third one. Um, ideally, 90% of that 20 plus dollars, they want invested in companies here in the state of South Carolina. And those monies are scheduled to be released in a, in a couple of weeks, I'd say within 30 to 45 days. Um, so, so there's going to be money here, um, and to more directly answer your question, I think 90, more than just over percent of the companies that I'm, you know, in the portfolio will be based here in the state of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, I knew, um, they created nation's, um, air traffic control system, missile guidance defense system. They've got a lot of dormant, um, intellectual property that they're going to license to Highmark, and then I have to find a management team. Hmm. All of those companies will be based here in South Carolina, and they will all be deep tech companies. And what company was that? We lost you for just a second. Who was that? MITRE, MITRE Ingenuity, M-I-T-R-E. Oh, yes. okay, okay, great, great. Yeah. So whenever um, I first met you, Herbert, I think you said you were th about 30 days away from, or was it 10 days, really close to closing your your first um, round. And I've just been curious ever since, like, what, what did that feel like? I mean, how much legwork till you got to that point? <laughs> I know I can't cuss on this. On this yes, on you this can. Podcast. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's chaos. This, this is it's where, just, where AHA meets oh shit. shit. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, it, yeah let it go. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's, I, I, I shared with a colleague the other day, you know, it's like, um, it's like a bell curve, working a bell curve. You know, you're going up one side, asking people for money. You get to the top, you get all the commitments. 
And then, you know, the, you know, you should be like on a J curve going up. Right. But you get on the other side and it's like, everybody's committed. Now you're like, okay, let's, let's close everything. Let's get everything closed. But um, once you start the process to close, now everybody has to read documents, attorneys get involved, account, and, and that's when it gets messy, right? Yeah. Um, I will tell you that I have what I call an aggregate fund. I've got a bucket of traditional dollars. I've got um, a debt facility of $5 million to provide bridge, bridge loans to folks. And then there's a bucket of grant dollars. Um, I'm expecting to close anywhere between at 22 to $30 million within the next 30 to 45 days. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Do you have a measure for um, what success to you? I mean, does that, does that, is that, yeah, what are your goals? Success for me? Yeah, you yeah. personally. Um, you know, me personally is, I, I guess I can encapsulate it this way. It's, I've danced in the end zone enough in, in, in my life. My goal is to get um, you know, a hundred or more entrepreneurs into the end zone so that they can dance. Mm -hmm. I want to see them be successful. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I mentioned the, the, the three traditional buckets I'm working with a regional financial institution. Um, I'd asked them to invest in my fund and they came back and said, well, would you consider, um, doing accelerators in the rural communities in South Carolina and the coast and the, um, um, the, the neighboring counties of Georgia and North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. So it's really, it's two types of accelerators. It's going in where an entrepreneur just has their idea on the back of a napkin. Let's, let's talk for four weeks to see what you need to do to see if there's a there there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's another accelerator called the beta accelerator where the entrepreneurs, they may have some revenue, they've got some customers. Let's see what we need to do to get them to the next level and possibly get them $100,000 uh, of capital so that they can get on that rocket ship to go to the next level. So it, it's really, it's waking up knowing that there are a lot of folks across the state in partnership with me to make their dreams come true. Hmm. I love that. That's a great goal. Yeah. <laughs> Do people, you know, you're, you're so much in the business, um, um, or not, not in the business, but, you know, in, in, in hand in hand with the folks that you're funding, it sounds like, and what kind of things do they, you know, what kind of challenges are they express? Because I think it's exciting to get that funding, but also I think a little mm -hmm. terrifying for a lot of people, what kinds of things do they talk with you about when mm -hmm. it's, you know, when it gets scary? You know, Jenna, I will tell you, um, most of these folks are so excited that, um, someone's agreed to write a check. Hmm. I mean, they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're the few exceptions who back equity um, because the minimum equity for me is, is 12%. Um, I was talking with a data science company a few weeks ago and uh, it was this cat and mouse play, right? And they, they showed me their financials and, um, and then it's, well, Herbert, what, what kind of equity are you looking for? And, you know, when you're on Zoom, you can see people's expressions, right? And yeah. um, and I said, you know, my floor is 12%. And um, it was a girl, with a, a young lady and a young man. And they said, well, okay, yeah, we were somewhere around that. And I said, my floor is 12%. So I just want to make sure that we're clear. <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> and they told me the valuation and what they were asking for. But the, the valuation and the number that people would have put me somewhere at 10%. And I just had to reiterate that it, that it's 12%. Um, because <laughs> you know, the floor is 12% because, and, and then also it's, you know, if, if I'm the first one in, uh, I want to make sure that I've got a few perks. Um, I'll get the pre money valuation. Anybody else after that will get the post money valuation. So yeah. I'll, you know, I, I want my position to be worth a little bit more than people who decide to come in next because if you thought that much of the, the business, you should have hopped on the right. train. That's right. In, 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 in the beginning. But I have, um, you know, this is happening every day, right? I got a, an email from a, a young man. He's here and two of his partners are in California. And he said, can you send me a list of the docs that you, you want us to review? They've got international relationships, right? Like with China, um, China, India, and Africa. And I, I asked a simple question. I need to see the docs relative to China, because now you're getting into geopolitical stuff 
And I need to make sure that your North American assets are protected against what some play that China may do and lock up the whole their company, right? Right, yeah. And so now they're, and I've asked for the stuff like five times, right? So mm-hmm. I got the email, I sent the same list again. So it's like the broken record <laughs> technique. I don't say, I've already told you this. I simply answer the question and keep going, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's serious, that's, though, because, I mean, there's, you know, pending legislation and everything. So you really could, the, mm-hmm. the risk yeah. level could. Well, and the legality, and the, like you said, the protection we've heard from trademark lawyers of China is just a, a whole different ball game, And a lot of entrepreneurs and startups don't necessarily protect their company from the beginning. Hmm. Um, yes. So, yeah. yeah. So, Her- Herbert, when you look at the landscape of VC in South Carolina, I mean, you've come in and entered, you know, this unique space. Are you seeing um, the landscape change with the other VC firms? We know it's light here in South Carolina, but um, are they? Is there a, a a goal or a mission for other VC firms at all to have like a percentage of their funds go to um, black-owned businesses or women-owned businesses? Is is that even a, a conversation they're having, or is it just best fund, best opportunity? I think the state. Yeah, I think the state of South Carolina with that 20 plus million I mentioned, um, they're, they're directing them to invest those dollars here. And there is an incentive to invest those dollars in BIPOC and women owned businesses. So, so, so that's one thing. And then the other thing I will mention is um, um, Venture Carolina, they've got a fellowship. It's called the Palmetto Venture Fellowship. That's and so their goal is to yeah, educate um, folks across the state about alternative investment in, okay. investing. So they, they, they talk about angel, they talk about VC, they talk about PE. Um, I'm a part of this election committee. I was also part of the inaugural cohort. Cohort number two starts in um, January. Okay. Um, cohort one had 40 okay. members from across the state and I could be targeting the same number uh, of folks for uh, cohort two. And I think they're funded through cohort number three. Hmm. So about folks um, and, and if I think that they may have marginal interest in VC now or later, I try I introduce them and, and submit their names to be a part of the uh, to be a part of cohort two. And that's what the Palmetto Fellowship. Did I hear Palmetto that? Venture Fellowship? Palmetto Venture Fellowship. Yeah, it's okay. essentially like an educational educating people about becoming funders. Is that is that correct? Yes. Becoming yeah, funders yeah. or it's, it's or getting months. fun? Becoming funders. Becoming funders. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's twelve months, one day a week in Columbia. Uh, not a heavy lift, and and they and they feed you, so it's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always, always show up for the free lunch, right? <laughs> well, well her, I must I, say that. Um, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, e-commerce is helping to fund that as well, so. Shout out to SC Commerce for, for leaning into that as well. Hmm. Great, thanks. I was going to say, now, you you know, you're now an entrepreneur and, and a founder yourself. We do ask, what is the, what's your biggest aha moment and what's what has been your biggest oh shit moment in your journey? Uh, I, I think my aha moment was, um, you know, at the time we had six companies I'm operating and I would go into each of the companies and sort of give the, the staff an update on the portfolio and how the portfolio was doing. And, um, and one of my, my director of nursing from one of the companies came up to me and, and she said, Herb, they don't care about that other shit. They just want to know what's happening with, 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 our, with, with medical. <laughs> and, uh, oh. and, and she was like, <laughs> they, they just care. And so I was trying to impose my entrepreneurial spirit and curiosity <laughs> onto them. So that was kind of a, um, that, that was an aha moment for me. And I, I think the, um, the, the, the oh shit moment as, as, as you asked JJ, it's when I realized that um, systemic racism is a real thing and it has a dollars and cents cost to it. Yep. Um, I, I'm, while I think that there are programs set up for, you know, like the 8A program and all of these other programs set up to help minority and women entrepreneurs. I, I don't think we should go into those relationships blindly. Um, 
one of my companies did win a, a contract because we got points because I'm an American, a local vendor, um, and I'm a veteran. Well, when the relationship soured with, with, the, with the client, they just went in and changed the rules hmm. and took those points away. Hmm. So, so you didn't have to be local. You didn't have, so if you, you put so much work and effort into getting these contracts, I, I think, and, and I think rightfully so that you can, you can make a lot of money doing so, but people mm -hmm. need to, entrepreneurs need to realize that those contracts have an end date and you have to reapply. And in most cases, it'll be fine. But if, but if the relationship sours, then you're going to be compromised. And if you're not financially um, structured in a way that you can endure that, it's just going to create all sorts of, of, of problems for you. Hmm. Herbert, has being on the this side of funding changed your perspective at all on just the business climate for entrepreneurs financially? No, 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 no. I, yeah, I, I will, you know, I'll use a Wall Street term. I, I am bullish on the entrepreneurs. Um, and, and it's because, you know, I, I talk to, you know, 10 or 15 a week. And these aren't, you know, no, 10 or 15 new ones a week. I mean, it's just exciting. Um, you know, I will I will give any entrepreneur 30 minutes of conversation. Hmm. Find time on the calendar and, and let's have a conversation. I, I think that the entrepreneurs are at different levels. And, and if you think of the funnel, um, you know, at the top of the funnel, you got all these idea, all these idea folks and mm -hmm. folks who may have written down something on a piece of paper. But the more you educate them and help them understand what are the steps that they need to take, obviously the ones that get to the bottom of the funnel are, are going to be the ones that, you know, get the attention, get the resources. But there, there are so many BIPOC and women entrepreneurs sitting at the top of the funnel that just need somebody to tell them, no, don't go here, go here. Or if you go here, you're going to stub your toe. Right. It's going to be incredibly painful. Um, so I, I am bullish on the entrepreneurs in, in the state of South Carolina and in this region for that matter. Yeah. Um, you just made me curious about something else. You were talking about a sort of like invisible ecosystem that for white funders who traditionally get funding is, is, is a strength for the business. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. what, what have you found um, with women and, you know, people of color in their you know, their networks, right? It's not like people are just out there alone, right. just doing nothing. There are networks and communities. And, and are there assets that mm -hmm. people have that you've seen are strengths for businesses? I'm going to try and answer the question I think you just asked me. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, if not, I'll ask, it, I'll ask another one. <laughs> well, I, I think for the most part, um, all the ideas are, 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 are great ideas, right? It's mm -hmm. just a question of whether or not the timing for that idea is now. And also, mm -hmm. it's a question of whether or not that person is the right um, individual to launch the company. Mm -hmm. right? um, that, that's what I find. Th those two things, I, you know, I have to ask that question. And then, mm -hmm. um, JJ and Jenna, it's a lot of entrepreneurs, they believe that they have to boil the ocean because um, they'll start talking to me about one thing and then they'll just go all over the place. Right. And, and while all of those things may be true, I'll simply ask, where, where do you want to start? <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's figure out where, where is the best place to start. And I think there's this perception that when you put together a business plan, you have to know where you're going to start and you have to have like four or five areas that you're going to, to to make the thing bigger than it really is, right? Mm -hmm. Well, but you probably, you, you do not have the bandwidth to execute on everything. And, and a lot of people will come in also with this thing called the addressable market. I mean, the addressable market is always going to be huge, right? And my challenge to, to all entrepreneurs is talk to me about your accessible market. Mm -hmm. Where do you have that? Who do you have that to that can get you into this market because you need a beachhead somewhere, right? Right. You can't, that's great that there's a, it's a billion dollar industry, but you may only be able to access $50,000 of that billion dollar industry, right? <laughs> Let, let's be real, realistic with that, right? That is an excellent point. That is. 
because I've always I've been in like a lot of those pitch rooms and you know it's always some massive number and I've never I've never yeah. heard anyone yeah. talk about no, their accessible yeah. market and we you know we coach yeah. on the other side of our business you know brand strategy and target audience and yeah the, the we have to kind of give reality numbers to to clients but I've never used that term I like it and I'm, I'm going to start using that we're building a glossary yeah and we were going to build a glossary of you know, just terms to explain things to people. But like, we're learning so much from people like you. Um, that I think we just need an, like a, a an orange the, whip gl- glossary. Yeah, of, the real, the real talk. There was one, it was your, your, um, your minimum, having your minimum viable conversation versus your minimum viable product, like starting there and that kind of thing. I think mm-hmm. we need to add that stuff. So I, her, her, mm-hmm. I'm curious, uh, you had said something earlier about, you know, the, the, as you started getting into this, um, to this space, the VC space, and listening to other VC firms, hedge firms, give reasons why they wouldn't, you said the the, the typical excuses of, I'm not going to invest in this company because of X, Y, Z. One, what what are some of those typical excuses? And, and when you look at and trying to get other people to come and invest with you to invest in these companies, how are you combating those typical excuses um so i'll tell you why why i'll answer that question this way by telling you why i would walk away from someone okay clearly if and i'll try to softly tell them where they need to pivot Mm -hmm. if the management team is flawed i'll ask a question such as if i see that they've got someone a coo slot I simply said, well, so you have this person in the COO slot, and but they've never run a company. Do you really think that that person is the right one you should have in that role? <laughs> um, so, so that's one. Um, the other scenario I will share is I, I said sometimes folks are all over the place. I will, you know, I had a conversation with a company, I mean, really good data science company, <laughs> and and I simply said, hey, can you just pick three use cases for me? And let me know how we would apply this. Well, they came back and we decided to focus on five verticals. The, you know, that was a good comeback, right? Not coming back to me and saying, hey, this market is big. You can't now buy. Well, you know, you put you have to. Mm-hmm. Or if I tell someone to give me a one pager, three pages, um, <laughs> and they, they're, they're adamant that they can't put their ID on one page. That's a problem I walk away with. If people can't accept constructive feedback or just ways to frame up their business to present to other folks, mm-hmm. yeah. then, then that's, that's typically where, where I end up walking away. Um, I have this one page of template that I have with folks. And so put your business, just answer the questions here on this page, right? <laughs> and people get creative. They will change the <laughs> margin from the document. To have- <laughs> Or insert page, insert they'll page. They'll change the letter size. I mean, the, the letter size is 12, so I'll get it back, and the letter size is like six. It's like a really a, a damn, you know, term, term sheet for, for a contract. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, not the creativity. I simply said, all right, let's re- recalibrate here. Leave the margins where they are. Yeah. Don't change the letter size. Like, I can't read this. Can this is so not going to work. <laughs> It's like, it's like your, your high school essay. I'm damn near 60 years old, and, and you're sending me something with letter size of six and four. You know, that's crazy. <laughs> that's hilarious. But, and, and what about, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the funders, so the investors that you're looking to to grow your fund? Um, what are, you know, some of the, the as, you, as you were beating the pavement, you know, the challenges that you had to investing in this particular, you know, these populations mm-hmm. of people? You know, one of the things I found um, frustratingly early on was that the public, the public, pro- the, the public proclamation did not match the policy and processes. Yeah. You, and I'm not going to name names, but a lot of companies came out and said, we're committing X number of million dollars for black owned businesses. It was well, optics. You know, <laughs> yeah. And, and then when you, then you, when you lean into it, right. Um, like a lot of firm, a lot of companies may say we want black VC, right? Hmm. Well, but their requirements to give money to a black VC is that you have to have at least two hundred fifty million dollars in assets under management. 
Well, if you're just starting, you're not going to have 250, right? So that's a barrier that they put up and they left up. And then some of them also said that, um, well, you have to have been investing for, um, you know, five, 10 years. Well, if you're a new fund manager, it's just not going to, to be there. Um, so th that's number one. That's why I, I kind of rolled with it and created a, an aggregate fund. There are tons of dollars out there, right? So those grant dollars can be used for wraparound support services to pay for the fractional executive, to pay for a marketing firm, to pay for the work that the CPA mm -hmm. firm will do, will pay for the accelerator that they're going to be a part of because we're coaching, we're coaching them up, right? So just, and, and I have, like I said, I have every financial institution or public company that has said that they're giving money to black owned businesses. I've leaned into them. And um, I'm, I'm getting, you know, my resources are coming from the state and um, two major financial institutions. I'll leave all that for the, um, for the press release that'll come out. <laughs> and then I think there, was, there, there are six individuals um, that are committing resources and then a, um, a, a capital firm uh, out of Chicago that's committing resources to the fund. Hmm. And do you think it's going to take a certain amount of traction before those other folks who, you know, weren't as accessible as maybe they purported to be might come around and mm -hmm. take advantage? I think, you know, typically, because this is a social issue, right? Yeah. A, a social issue. I, I, believe, um, I, I think there's going to have to take some of the nonprofits who have resources for them to start committing to these um, new managers and also folks at the state level like um, Commerce with Jetta is doing. So there are committing resources to say, hey, we're going to help. And then I think these other major financial institutions and um, I'd say corporate and academic foundations to lean into the space. You, you got you to gotta create sort of a narrow corridor for them to enter yeah. because it, it won't fit to their, their traditional or legacy processes. So once we create that now corridor and give them a way in, then I think we'll start to make some traction and, and get some real dollars into it. Awesome. Yeah. Does that make sense? It yeah, does. Absolutely. We, we feel like we're in that, that narrow corridor. <laughs> well, walking in that yeah, space yeah. with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I'm trying, sometimes I'm trying to find the damn door to get out of that hall. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have to talk about that. We'll have to catch up with you then and see how that works out for you. We are out of time. Um, Herbert, thank you so much. I feel like I've learned so much and um, great to get to know you a little bit. Yeah, I'm I, like, I'm blown away. Uh, I've, I've actually got a ton more questions, but I might have to ping you in person. Yeah, I mean, it's just um, it's so exciting what you're doing. Uh, first of all, just just high market yeah. itself is very exciting. So where so where you. where can yeah, others find? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, can I close with one, one message to entrepreneurs? Absolutely. Please. Oh, no, oh. you just froze. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. No, okay, back. Here, start over. Back. You're back. You're back. <laughs> What's the message? Every entrepreneur should have a desire to move from being an entrepreneur to an employer to an investor to a philanthropist. Mm. Ah. Did he you want to get to the and you want to get to the point where you're investing in um, companies such as yourself in the future. I love that. So it's entrepreneur to employer to investor to philanthropist. Did I miss one? Yes. Nope. And with the investor philanthropy piece, you're investing in companies and from an investing standpoint in the philanthropy piece, you're giving back to the community. Yeah. And that's, that's the path that I took. And I think it, it will work well for everyone. It's a good template and blueprint for folks to follow. Absolutely. Excellent. I love that. And Thank where, so where much. can people find more about Highmark, Highmark Capital? Uh, just highmarkcapital.com. H-I. Uh, H-I. Uh, yeah. H-I, yes. H-I-Mark, H-I-M-A-R-K, <laughs> capital.com. Um, and then wait a couple of weeks because the, the website is being refreshed. Um, they go, kind of go with my minimalist uh, mentality. So <laughs> just, just wait a couple of weeks. Okay. okay, excellent, excellent. I think Great. this will come out after that, so everything will be in line. Though. That's right. Be looking good. <laughs> well, and and for those that uh, uh, you know want to listen more about and and Herbert and this podcast, you can go to well, you can find Hello Chaos podcast on all your favorite platforms. We're we're everywhere, 
or you can go to Orange Whip. That's Orange W I P dot com, and uh, Hello Chaos is there there too. Yeah, check um, us out. Check us out. I think I think um, just looking at your website, we've been involved with some of the same folks um, either through the podcast Herbert or through the. Um, digital magazines that we do so Mm -hmm. that was also kind of cool Um, I think I saw Karen Thrower on your website and um, she's been somebody we've featured uh, down in Charleston so thanks again very much I hope you enjoy the rest of your day the rest of your week it's Monday (laughs) folks so we're all we were all (laughs) it's a Monday yeah it's a Monday (laughs) as we decided I don't know if we want to do podcast on a Monday anymore last Monday (laughs) sessions actually (laughs) we do better on Tuesdays and Thursdays (laughs) Well, thank you, Herbert. Thanks, Herbert. Bye. Bye. Bye.